and I would like to welcome all of you to our case speaker series webinar. Um, our guest speaker today is Crystal Davis. Crystal is, is joining us from Atlanta, so thank you for joining us today, Crystal. Uh, Crystal has over 20 years of experience as a successful speaker, coach, and consultant. She's had the privilege of working in various countries such as Spain, Portugal, Mexico, Sweden, all over the world, it sounds like, right, Crystal? That's uh, right. She's uh, worked in a number of different industries using Lean and Six Sigma, um, specifically automotive functions, other manufacturing sectors, healthcare, engineering, um, and has done significant facilitation, coaching, and consulting. Um, Crystal has a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Engineering and an MBA, plus she is a Six Sigma, uh, Lean Six Sigma Black Belt and a John Maxwell Leadership Coach. So we would love to welcome Crystal today. Crystal, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And really the, the main thing that I want uh, people to take away from that is you're taking a time out of your busy schedule to listen to me. And uh, my hope is that you will gain at least one nugget that you can take away and start to implement immediately in your process. And I am presuming that because you're here, you are having some challenges or are interested in uh, continuing to learn more about uh, leveraging the daily management process in your lean journey. Um, so why should you listen to me? One, I have very practical experience actually um, in the operation. So I haven't spent all of my career actually consulting and coaching. And so I've, I've leveraged my uh, real world experiences to help in how I, um, how I actually coach and lead and train in a very unique fashion um, to help people really understand what they should be doing and how to address their pain points. And so that's what I want to share with you today. And before we jump into the material, I, I do want to just reiterate that the assumption here is that you are knowledgeable about daily management and you're aware of the stand-up process or huddle process as some of you may uh, know it as and that you're familiar with the um, the tools that we utilize to facilitate daily management like the actual huddle boards or production reporting boards and things of that nature and I can't see um, who all of the participants are and if the majority of you are in operations or manufacturing and supply chain or if you're in an office environment. So please feel free at any time to ask a question, post a question in the chat uh, function if you want me to specify how I would uh, make this inference or apply the situation in terms of an office versus uh, say manufacturing or service um, process versus the manufacturing process. All right. So let me see if I have control here to move to the next slide. Yes, absolutely. All right, so let's start off with this whole notion of daily management. And I thought that um, this, this picture really represented kind of um, some of the pushback I get when I talk to people about stand-up uh, meetings or huddle boards or even the daily management process. But when you When you think about it, people will huddle and talk about problems going on in the office or in the, in the operations, whether it's a formal structure or not. So we are all familiar with the water cooler talk, right? And the risk with the water cooler talk is that um, they're left to their own devices or their own, uh, their own uh, perceptions about what's real and what's not. So I like to always say, if they're going to stand around and talk about the problems anyway, then let's figure out how to create a structured approach that allows them to really talk about the problems from a perspective of using uh, real data and facts and engaging cross-functional people in helping to solve the problems. Next slide. Joanna, it doesn't look like I have control to shift. So if you can just flip, flip to the next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, you should have control now if you're still trying to try it. All right, I see it spinning, so. I will flip it for you. Yeah, it's not working. Thank you. All right, so the other main uh, reason that I really love the daily management process, one is because it engages everyone in the process. I'm sure many of you may be familiar with the hero or heroine syndrome that happens in a lot of organizations. And so uh, to mitigate that, we want to make sure that we're involving and engaging all people in the process. And that's critically important uh, when you're talking about um, your lean journey. It's not to isolate certain people who only have, say, a green belt or a black belt. It's really about how can you engage everyone in the organization to help solve problems. And it doesn't mean that they all need to be lean experts or Six Sigma experts. It really just means that you're expecting people to come to work every day, engage in, in fulfilling their tasks and responsibilities. So why not leverage them to actually help to solve problems, especially the problems that they see uh, every day or the struggles that they have every day in getting uh, completing their tasks. Uh, oftentimes, when we start working in a new area, the first thing we do is we uncover a tremendous amount of phantom processes that people have created because they're not able to accomplish the task uh, as the system is designed. So let the, another reason daily management is incredibly important is that it helps you avoid or mitigate or, or minimize, I'll say, the hero syndrome. Next slide, please. All right, and just a little bit to touch on the, the, the session objectives. One, I want to be able in this session not to train you on daily management or huddle process but really how should you as leaders, whether you're a team lead, a manager, a supervisor, an executive within the organization, how can you leverage this process to actually develop, um, develop your people? So where do you need to influence with more coaching and leadership development? And then how can you make sure that the management system or the business system or the operating system, whatever you call it, how can you make sure that you understand the level of effectiveness that the, that the system has? And then I really want to, to, to try to influence and illustrate why the daily interaction is so critical uh, as it relates to the management system. So those are the things that uh, I hope you get out of this. So here's an opportunity for you to engage. So what is daily management? And you should be able to answer from the poll questions. One is, do you consider it just a stand-up huddle where leaders uh, inform on the status of production? Do you think about the daily management process as just boards where associates can write down all of the problems that they're having and hope that the leaders will actually uh, correct the problems? Do you really understand and leverage daily management as a management system, and what does that mean? A management system as to how you actually run your business, how you make critical decisions, or is it all of the above? We're just having uh, the votes roll in, or we'll give it another couple seconds before we close up the poll for school. Okay. Okay, so go ahead and look here and close the poll. the results. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So we have a wonderful, I mean, there's no wrong answer here because it's really about where you are in, in, in the journey. But mm -hmm. it really is about all of the above. We shouldn't look at the system to just be, um, you can put thank you. We shouldn't just look at the system to, um, to tell us about our uh, production status. I mean, if you think about it, I would have a lot of uh, operations say to me, well, you know, I'm only writing this up here for management. And so they were quite aware of where they, they stood in terms of production, but there was a disconnect between why they were share, posting the information 
and why it was relevant to a team lead, supervisor, or manager. It's also not just a place, uh, and I've experienced this as well, where associates, you ask associates, well, tell us why you weren't able to accomplish the, um, the production results for the hour. And so you get uh, people that start posting a lot of problems. Well, this machine was not working effectively, or I didn't have this information, or I didn't have these parts, or you know, my system went down. And what we really want to do is make sure that we're not just giving people a place to list their problems, but then we leverage that to say and ask questions that help develop them to start to figure out how do we actually solve these problems. So of course we want people to share. We want them, we want to really, really engage them in sharing the information. But as a, as a leader in the organization, and I use the word leader uh, loosely because I believe leaders are not just people with positions or titles. So when I reference the word leader here, I'm referencing anyone with, that, that's able to influence the organization. But we want to make sure that we're not giving people just a place to uh, post problems, but a place to engage them in actually solving the problems that they're able to solve at their respective levels. And that will make a little bit more sense as I talk about um, tiered management a little bit later. But before we move on here, I want to just address why does it matter? Why does daily management matter? And why is it so critical to your lean management system, operating system, or business system? Many of you may be familiar with the Toyota um, principles of go see, ask why, and show respect. The daily management problem, uh, I'm sorry, daily management process helps to make connections between when you go out and you go observe where the actual work is taking place and identify gaps within the system. Secondly, it allows you to engage with what they're actually experiencing when you're, you're not around, i.e. what problems are they having. Two, it allows you to ask why, not who, but ask why, so that you are showing respect, that you respect that this person has been working in this, in this job for one year, five years, 30 years. You know, 40, I've, I've worked with some machinists that have been working for 43 years. It really allows you to engage with them and be able to pull out of them what they see, that tribal knowledge, that experiential knowledge that will help you be able to solve problems that you may not realize or recognize are happening just by uh, leveraging data in your processes. So that's why it really, really does matter. That's how you can really, really engage people. So another thing to think about here is what are some of the organizational struggles? So one is engaging associates in problem solving or continuous improvement. A lot of people may feel like, you know what, I just want to come to work, I want to do my job, and I want to go home and be happy with my family. Which is essentially what we all want, but we need to shift the mindset that doing your job is involves problem solving and continuous improvement. And that you're a smart individual, you have a talent, we rely on you to accomplish a task, and so we also allow on you to tell us where there are gaps and opportunities to improve in the system. Some other organizational struggles are um, dealing with the same problems over and over. And many of you may be familiar with root cause analysis and, you know, getting to the five why to solve problems, but sometimes problems are just really, really so big that they manifest themselves in a very similar way, but there's a different solution. So there are actually multiple uh, iterations of continuous improvement and problem solving that need to happen. The third one I've talked about uh, a little bit, it's to really make a connection between the daily challenges and, can, and your continuous improvement um, processes. So otherwise, I always say to people, and this relates to the fourth bullet about achieving metrics on a, metric targets on a consistent basis. Um, why wait until the end of the month to get month in reports to try to then figure out where you need to go to solve problems when you miss the target? The second thing is I often encounter a lot of organizations where they are tasked or charged by the leadership to go implement lean, to go do lean. 
and then they start to do a lot of activity. Daily management helps you, should help you align with where you should be focused on doing Kaizen or uh, continuous improvement efforts so that you're supporting the problems that you're actually dealing with on a daily basis. I hope that makes sense. And then the lastly is with uh, strategy deployment. Many of you may have heard of like Hosh and Conry, policy depo deployment. And so what you really want to do is take this opportunity to connect the actions that you're taking every day to deliver on the business, the continuous improvement initiatives that you're focused on to improve the business, and connect that with your strategy that really will take the business to the next level. So an example of that would be in manufacturing, if you're looking at bringing in new business uh, that requires space, floor space for new equipment, um, it may challenge your warehouse space. You want to really be thinking about your continuous improvement initiatives that will align where you can identify opportunities to reduce your floor, your, uh, floor space. You can right size inventories so that you won't have to go out and procure additional warehouse space or additional buildings for production space. So you really want to try to align those things strategically so that you're, the effort that you're putting into problem solving and continuous improvement will really have a much, much bigger payoff. I hope that makes sense. All right, so when we think about daily management, um, I like to think about these in terms of principles or tenets. And the reason that I do that is because uh, the first question that I'm often asked by people is, well, how should we standardize the board? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Or what should go on the board? Like, you know, what metrics are important to put on the board? And um, so these principles or tenets should help guide you in terms of how to make the, the process more effective for yourself. So one, linking it to a business case, mission, or objective. That's important because people rally behind a why. Why are we doing this? So if you can illustrate a purpose as to why you're doing this, people can really rally behind that. And make it very, very clear and as transparent as you possibly can. If you are, as a, as a, in the situation that I just mentioned, if you're focused on um, growing organically by, say, 5 or 6%, and you have an area where you know if you're able to make an improvement, you can see a 30 or 40 percent reduction in footprint, and that helps your growth strategy. Make sure you communicate that and share, hey, here's why we're doing this. We're not just doing this to disrupt your day. We've talked about pitch and pacing of the work. Always make the targets very clear. Not only what the target is, but by when. And then focus on between the business case mission objective and the target, what data should be collected to help us be able to understand if we're moving the needle, if we're taking actions that move us in the right direction. Uh, always, always you have to enable problem solving and continuous improvement on, on your, uh, in your daily management process. And that simply means don't just collect data, Make sure there's an area where people can write down a problem that they're experiencing, there's a space for a countermeasure, and then there's a date and a person responsible to follow up on that countermeasure. And the countermeasure should be fairly immediate. It should not be a six-month project. It should be a fairly immediate response to counter the problem that they're experiencing. The next thing is you have to have accountability um, Across, across functions of management. So uh, I'll give you uh, an example. I was um, visiting with a client and I was observing their tier process. And uh, several functions were representative, supply chain, quality, engineering, um, material, uh, the materials department, as well as manufacturing. And I went, I heard all of these support functions say that they didn't have any problems or issues for the day. But when it got to the manufacturing person who had already uh, re done their report, they reported out on several uh, challenges that they were having that were going to prevent them from meeting the day's schedule. And so I simply asked the question, how is it that manufacturing can have a problem 
and they rely on engineering quality uh, supply chain and materials to execute um, based on information, parts, etc. How is it that they have a problem but you don't? And so it's really about creating that connection. And then the sixth principle is making sure that you have a very clear connection to your customer, both your internal customer from a process perspective as well as your external customer. Um, making sure that you're sharing the feedback. Um, sometimes I work with areas they're not even aware of who their customer is or what their customers think and feel about their level of quality, their level of service. So it's very important that you become very, very customer-focused, customer-centric uh, as a principal. And then have a standard agenda or and or standard work. I just had a wonderful, wonderful um, experience with a client just this week where there was some, there was, um, I'll say some tension between manufacturing and supply chain. And it was simply a matter of not under, not having a clear understanding of what the standard expectation was from both groups. And they took the time, after, uh, after a bit of frustration, they actually took the time to develop and create what the standard work would be from supply chain as viewing manufacturing as a customer. So in other words, they would come to the daily management meeting equipped with a standard uh, set of, of information. So um, an example would be schedule changes that they, that they foresee or if they got word that a supplier was having some problems even though they might not have the impact for a couple of weeks, that was the type of information that manufacturing wanted to have. They wanted to have that advanced information. So by simply creating some standard work, they understood what one another should bring, what, what information manufacturing desired to have and what information supply chain was able to provide and by when. And it really minimized this, um, this defense that people have when they feel like another function either doesn't understand what they have to deal with or their pain and then making sure that, um, that they, they come and they're, they're accountable for reporting that information. And then the eighth and the last one, which is the most important element to why we do any of this stuff. Abnormalities should be visually obvious. In other words, if everything was working perfect in our organization, we wouldn't really need to have this daily management process. People could come in, they could just do their job, everybody's happy, we don't have any problems, and we can move forward. The objective of most of everything that we do within the lean realm is to make abnormalities as visible as possible so that we can mitigate them and that they don't fester and create much bigger, bigger problems. So that is really, really key. And I recommend, oh, and I'll talk about this later, but when it comes to abnormalities, um, you, making them visible is, is uh, very easy with color coding and things of that nature. The challenge that I find most organizations have is that they don't, they are afraid to be transparent about what's not working well. And so if you deal with this in your organization, you have to ask yourself some really, really tough questions about your culture. If your culture is a blaming culture, if your culture is one that doesn't want to deal with problems until they might actually reach a point to where there's, you, you are forced to deal with it, then I really, really, will challenge you to rethink that and if you're able to deal with problems on a daily basis when they're really, really small, in the long run, it'll be work in the beginning, but in the long run, you will so appreciate it. But make sure that your your culture is in a position where you're, you're free to share when things are not working well. Awesome. So this is another question that I get often by from leaders with the boards. Should the boards be standard? Should the boards uh, not be standard? And I especially get this question when I'm uh, asked, when leaders are trying to implement the boards in, or this daily management process in um, an office environment where they've started in manufacturing, things are much more visual in manufacturing. You can see when machines are not working, 
You can see when people are working at the right pace, et cetera, et cetera. Here's my recommendation. Um, standardization is good, but it is an evolution of learning, right? And so oftentimes leaders want the board standard so that when they're able to uh, visit multiple value streams or work areas, information is, is shared in a consistent manager, man, in a, uh, manner, I'm sorry. And that's important. But initially, initially, I really, really push very, very hard on my clients to allow the boards to evolve. Why? Because the people that actually have to engage with the boards, those are the ones that you want to make sure they are learning about how to see gaps, how to forecast uh, when things may happen in the organization, and also uh, that they engage with problem solving and that they're able to see, you know what, I am three weeks into, um, into, into the month and we're not trending. Uh, it looks like we're going to be off, you know, I'll say um, off on hitting our, our production targets, which ultimately impacts the revenue uh, for, the, for the business that month. So you want people to be able to have an opportunity to learn and evolve. And then once you mature, you can really, really start to hone in on the standards of, of what uh, information is relevant to people, what information is not so relevant, and then making sure that the boards don't come across as, uh, you know, we're just posting this information so the management can walk about and see what's going on. All righty, so um, I'm going to ask, I want to prepare you guys, so after I cover this slide, I'm going to ask you a question about the things that I've talked about thus far, and so I want you to get prepared to, uh, to engage in the chat. All right, so the, the, the next thing before I jump into that question is really about, um, as a leader, how do you then improve the process? And so... Uh, sometimes it often starts with leaders or and or the participants of the daily management process getting frustrated that they actually uh, aren't getting value from this. And so there's some cues that you can pick up on. One is I'm always watching uh, people's body language. Are people just standing around? Two, as the first bullet indicates, is the information that's being shared valuable? And do we need to make a shift on the questions that are being asked and or on the level of accountability that um, those who need to provide countermeasures are given? So I'll give you an example. So um, one with a client, um, we had a tremendous quality problem in uh, with a product from a supplier. Well, during the meetings, we were talking about some of the basic elements that they deal with on a daily basis. Were you able to achieve your schedule? Did you have any machine downtime? Um, you know, were you able to complete the standard? Just kind of general information. But yet, you sense that people are really, really struggling because they don't have a response for how they're going to address this supplier quality issue. So I, in, I, I coached the group at that time, why are we not talking about, if everything else is green and it's good to go, we don't need to talk about it just because we're, we're here to, to stand up for 10, 15 minutes. We really need to get at the heart of what's abnormal, what the abnormal condition is at this moment in time. And let's take that time to lay out a game plan. So make sure that you don't get into, into this um, this routine of just following like this, this very strict cadence that doesn't allow you to, to really be present in, uh, in what's going on right now. The second is start the meeting on time with a targeted completion. Uh, you, when you see people kind of looking down at the ground, you know, they probably are thinking, you know what, this is a waste of my time. So make sure that you start on time, you end on time, and if you need to end early that, you're, that you can do so but that you're, you're covering valuable information. Uh, when it comes to updating the information um, at the beginning or just before, 
I actually prefer that people actually engage with updating information and referencing the information while they're actually in the stand-up meeting. It's okay if you have a lot of information to, that needs to be updated that you do so in the beginning or just before the meeting, but you don't want information to be stale. You don't want it to be old, and you, that's one of the ways that you can check and make sure that information is uh, valuable to what's happening right now. And then when a set of information or information updates don't actually align with the daily review, then set a frequency to review that information. So perhaps you don't need to review, um, you don't need to review, let's see, I'm trying to think of a metric off the cuff here and struggling. So, but my point is, if there's some information that you find valuable in terms of a metric, or um, a, a graph, but it doesn't align with, re with reporting daily, then make it maybe a weekly cadence. So every Wednesday, oh, I found an example. So every Wednesday, uh, we'll review engineering changes, upcoming engineering changes. Might not make sense for you to review that every day, but at least every Wednesday, I know that I can depend on having engineering changes, upcoming engineering changes reviewed, and the team can have a chance to give feedback on if any of that uh, will be a challenge, which you will then take offline and, and resolve. I've talked about color coding. So, you know, again, making those things very, very visual, visual. And then the next one, challenge what gets escalated so that you can drive problem solving at the lowest level. I'm going to pause here and probably go a little bit longer on this one. This is so important because um, team leads, so anyone with a title often feels that it is their responsibility to solve a problem. And in a lot of organizations, even the associates feel like it's the leader's responsibility to solve a problem. You may hear people say, oh, that's above my pay grade, or no, I'm not going to get involved in that. That doesn't uh, involve uh, the work that I do. But what we really want to do is create a, a culture of problem solvers, an organization of problem solvers. And so we need to identify what problems should be able to be solved at the production level, at the cross-functional level, at the manager level, and even at the executive level. And as a leader, it's your responsibility to push back on wanting to solve that problem. You really have to, to challenge yourself to not tell people what to do, but to ask great questions to engage them on uh, understanding how they're thinking about solving the problem or if it even needs to be escalated. So that's a very, very, very important um, challenge for leaders um, to overcome. And I always tell leaders this, uh, I have this, this running quote, you know, uh, I'll have, I have the leader stand up in a room and, and I'll say, repeat after me, please. I don't know, but, and the but is an opportunity, that statement in itself is, and with the but is an opportunity for the leader to then say, we can learn together. Tell me what you think. Um, who do you need to um, help you solve this problem? Or are there any roadblocks or obstacles that I can help remove so that you're able to get this problem solved? So it really, really frees up that leader from feeling responsible for having to do, um, to having to solve the problem and really kind of pushing that back on um, the area that, that, have, that is experiencing the problem. The next thing is to make sure that the information flows both ways. And so we often think about this. I have a slide later that kind of shows how this needs to flow. But we often think about information flowing up from production, you know, up to the next level and up to finally the leadership. But it's also important that that information flows back down as well. And that if you make a commitment to um, at your cross-functional level to solve a problem, then that information should be taken back to the associates and says, and let them know, here's what engineering plans to do to resolve our issue and by when. And here's maybe the help they need from us to test the solution, et cetera, et cetera. But you want to make sure information is going both ways. 
Then next, set problem triggers and rapid response plans. So this is critically important for a leader to be able to engage the effect effectiveness of their daily management um, system or process. So a lot of times people will have problems that are reoccurring. And it's not yet reached a point where we need to apply resources to it. Um, it's just something we're going to kind of deal with and, and, and address later because a lot of organizations, uh, the resources are constrained working on larger scale pro projects. But we need to reach a point to where we identify what's critical so that we know uh, or, or how often does it need to happen before we know we need to address it. And then what is the response plan? The reason that we capture problems in the daily management process is so that we can apply a countermeasure. And then we want to make sure that the countermeasure was effective. So a lot of organizations may say, well, you know what? What is a line down condition? And how, what is our response plan to a line down condition? Um, I work in automotive, so my background is automotive. And I can recall being in the OEM and observing that the robots that installed the windows went down. Within three minutes, three minutes, maintenance was there and they were simulating the work of the robot as to not shut down the line while there were other maintenance personnel that were looking at the road troubleshooting the robot. So having plans like that that become standards of work where everybody knows when this happens, if this happens three times, here's our response plan. That way you don't allow things to fester. And then the last one, communicate, communicate, communicate with countermeasures and recovery plans. So I can't, I can't stress this enough. Um, when you just allow things, people to just state the problem and you don't talk through where here's the countermeasure or here's the recovery that we think uh, we need to put in place and, and develop and communicate an effective plan it's a huge, huge risk for people to get really, really frustrated, extremely frustrated because they're dealing with something every single day and they don't see, they can't see the light. So a recovery plan example would be if you have a backlog and you're in a period where your volume is pretty, pretty static, um, but you need to have a plan for figuring out how you're going to address the backlog. Without having a very clear plan, the sales organization or customer service organization can't communicate back to their customers when they will actually receive their products. So that's a point of frustration for them. Manufacturing may not understand their overtime plan um, to fulfill these, this backlog. And so now you may be asking people to work daily overtime and weekly overtime. And before you know it, people have been working overtime for three months. They're frustrated because they can't they miss out on their kids' soccer games or they can't go to the play, or they just can't have a date out with their, with their significant other. So you want to make sure that you're taking the time to develop a countermeasure and a recovery plan uh, when, you, when you see yourself challenged, and then communicate effectively to that plan. So I want to pause here and engage the group. Yeah, you can leave the slide there. Thank you. No, that's, that's fine. I want to engage the group, and I want to just see, um, do a check-in and see how many of you are actually experiencing some of the, the organizational struggles that I mentioned. And uh, with that, if you don't mind sharing or asking a question about uh, a particular situation where, um, where you've, you've experienced some of the things that I've mentioned. I just want to do a check-in with the group. And Joanna, don't forget, you'll have to tell me what the, the chat or there. <laughs> so if anyone's got any uh, thoughts, ideas, please, uh, please provide. I'm not seeing much there, Crystal. Maybe do you want to repeat the question for everybody? Yeah, so the question is, I, I really share, shared a lot with you about, as a leader, um, things that you should be looking out for to make sure that your daily management system is effective or some organizational challenges that you have. And I just want to do a sense check with the group that if you're using the daily management process, does this align with some of the things that you're kind of feeling or sensing?
Okay. Saw a hand up there. No responses yet? No responses yet. Alrighty, I'll keep moving. Can I, can I just ask, um, I'm going to ask Ken because I saw a hand up. Can you just type something in there, Ken? I just want to make sure we're actually getting questions. How about anyone? <laughs> All right. I've got a feeling we're not we're not getting. Uh, oh, there we go. Perfect. So I am seeing stuff. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you, Brenda, for that. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Uh, just All right. Awesome. Awesome. So I hope to this point, um, um, it it is re the information is resonating with some of you, uh, and as a in in terms of coaching for daily management. All of these are triggers that you should be looking for as, as leaders in your organization um, in terms of if you have effective daily management and where you have gaps in the system that you're mitigating those gaps. So the benefits of daily management I think are clear. One, uh, you can engage and involve everyone in the process. Um, two, you can begin to really develop and understand where people are in terms of their problem solving skills and also for your team leads, supervisors, etc., are they effectively coaching their uh, team members how to see? So I don't know, many of you may be familiar with learning to see. Are they able to see ways? Are they able to really see problems? Are they able to, to, um, to anticipate problems and challenges, and can they get in front of it? And then from a daily perspective, we're not waiting and allowing really, really big problems to manifest in the organization, we're actually addressing them when they're kind of small and they're, they're man more manageable. So. so with that, I'm going to make a shift and I'm going to talk about uh, more about the people element. Of, you can go to the next slide. More about the people element. And so I term this lead lean. I term this lead lean because um, uh, of a number of reasons, and this isn't the first time I've talked about it. Um, there's a there's a lot of buzz in the lean environment about why lean fails, and you know, I think the question in itself is genuine because there's so much to be gained from uh, problem solving and continuous improvement and engaging people in in that process. And to me, that if you just boil, you know, lean Toyota production system, Six Sigma, all of that stuff down to, to its most basic element, that's essentially what it's meant to do. Organizations are having some struggles. How can we use data? How can we use our people and, and talent to help us solve those problems so that we can sustain our business, become a, uh, remain or become a very profitable company? But I like to focus, what I don't like about um, the, the language that we use in the lean industry is we talk about lean leadership. And in most Western cultures, uh, we tend to put a lot of responsibility and blame on people when things don't work right. We focus on process improvement, but somehow we end up making it about what people did wrong or didn't do, do right. And so for me, I want to shift, I want to shift the mindset, shift the paradigm, and shift the language to where lead, we're leading lean not just lean leaders, but leading lean, where lead lean is really about people. It's really about the verb of leading, not the noun of leadership. And it's really about lean as in, in action. And so that's why in this, this webinar, I really want you to understand what actions should I be taking as a leader in the organization to make sure that I'm making sure that the system is working effectively. And so I want to really, really start a movement where we get focused on what's really important, and that's the, the aspect of leading. Next slide, please. And so when we think about this, leading lean is very different. It requires a different level of leadership. And I love this quote, and I've shared it before with, uh, with the PACE audience we, from uh, Peter Drucker. We now accept the fact that learning is a lifelong process 
of keeping abreast of change. And the most pressing task is to teach people how to learn. And that is essentially the, the task or challenge that leaders have in coaching for daily management. It's not about you having all the answers and about you telling people what to do, but how do you become a leader who teaches people how to learn? And, how, and then how are you able to evaluate how they're thinking and where you can do more coaching um, to help them learn the, um, I hate to use the word, the, the correct way, but uh, the way that aligns with the principles um, of lean, the way that aligns with the, the culture that you want to develop in the organization, and a way that aligns with the, the business priorities that you've set forth in your organization. So that is really, really the challenge here. All right, so here we come into, um, uh, I'm gearing you up for some, some engagement here. So uh, what are the things that leaders should do to support the process um, and make sure that the process is effective? So what are some things that you do in your daily management process that you that help you make sure that uh, you're coaching effectively, you're making sure that people are accountable to problem solving, or that you are identifying gaps in your early in your process uh, before you uh, before a metric truly uh, goes off the rails and in the wrong direction. And then I'll tell you some things I think. Love to get some comments, and Ken, I got your comment, and we'll share that a little bit later. Don't be shy. We can't see it anyway, so. <laughs> Any responses? Not on that question. Um, we, we had someone who was trying to comment on the use of the communications board, and, and uh, so I, I can share that. Okay. Perfect. A little bit, and then we'll jump into uh, as people are, are adding in their ideas. So, um, Ken from Kitchener was talking about working with a with a mining company and using uh, daily commu communication boards and huddles to uh, to get information in from the supervisors and the guys on on. Uh, uh, mucking and drilling and things like that, recording their, their targets, uh, why they missed their targets or exceeded their targets on a control chart, and that was really uh, generated a lot of active discussion on, on problems and things that would come up, issues that would come up and, and, and come up with solutions to the issues. So I think that's a really good example of what you're talking about. Oh, that's absolutely, that's a great example. and. You know, I'm sure I'm, I'm not sure uh, totally how they are set up, but in particular, if they're looking for information from from people in the field, you know, looking for ways to to um, to kind of get that information more automated, where people might be able to use mobile devices is another great opportunity. So they're sharing information on the spot um, yes. back to us, like a central hub location or something of that of that nature. So. You know, really simple dashboards that can yeah. be uh, viewed on a on an iPad or a tough book or any of those types of things if people are working in the field. This is another great um, example that a lot of sales associates use when they're in the field to report information back um, if they're out in the field and noticing that um, there's not enough product on the shelf or they are seeing uh, an issue with a customer. They can report that information back in. So. So great example. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, we've got a couple responses um, from leaders or, or things that leaders should do. Um, Heather uh, indicated using active listening techniques. Oh, yes. Thanks great. for that, Heather. Um, uh, we had Kathy said, uh, I request input from my staff and to visually show me what's being accomplished, which leads to discussion about deadlines, challenges, etc. Awesome. Um, Kelsey said some of our discussions are communication, asking questions, listening, not resolve issue for associates. That's right. Absolutely. Awesome. Great. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, some other some other things that you know leaders should be doing to to support 
uh, an effective process um, is simply checking in with the the people, the department leads or the work cell leads about how the daily management process is working for them, what's working well, what's not working so well, and then asking them what would they do differently. Those are some very, very powerful questions that allow you to, to engage with them on a routine basis, whether it's quarterly, um, that you check in, or even monthly if you want, but to really, really check in with those people that are responsible for that area where daily management is taking place to ensure that they're not, not only thinking about the daily problems that they're having in operations or, or whatever the process is, but they're also thinking about system improvements, the management system improvements. These tools only serve us if we make them um, work for us. And so you need to check in. And that's part of that evolution that I talked about, uh, talked about before. All right. Thank you. Next slide. All right. And then I just wanted to talk a little bit about leader standard work. Uh, and it's probably not the traditional leader standard work that some of you may be familiar with. But it's leader standard work when it comes to coaching for daily management. Okay. So how do you check in to make sure that the various uh, functional areas and departments are engaging and involving everyone in the process? And again, I talked a little bit about some tidbits of uh, uh, ways that you can, you can really check in on that. Are people not really speaking up in those stand-up meetings? Are they standing around with their head down? Uh, are the meetings going you know, too long, which means they might be talking of trying to solve some very, very specific problems at the board that don't include all of the people that are actually there to report out in the process. Two, if you start to feel comfortable, then that is an indicator that you've kind of maybe either plateaued or reached the status quo. So how can you do a check-in where you're getting comfortable with being uncomfortable? And this doesn't mean chaos or, you know, having, you know, chaos and churn always in your organization. But it is really, really good if you have a, a cadence where you reflect and identify, you know what, things are going too smooth. It's, it's kind of like the reverse of, uh, it's kind of like being uh, pessimistic, you know, where you're like, things are going really too smooth. Something's on the horizon and I'm not sure what it is. But you want to create a cadence where you're actually checking in to see if people are comfortable. And then remember that learning is the goal. So uh, combine three and four. Learning is the goal. So how do you teach people how to learn? And how do you teach your leaders how to teach their people how to learn? So um, great book by John Maxwell. Good lead, I mean great quote, I'm sorry. Good leaders ask great questions. So many of you may be familiar with uh, Kata, coaching Kata. So you want to ask questions about, I always lead with this, what problem are we trying to solve? Because if we're, if we're not aligned on the problem that we're trying to solve, then we're going to have a very, very tough conversation. You can ask people about what they observe. What, did they, what do they think should be done? How would they do things differently? Just create four or five simple questions that become a, a routine cadence that you ask your, um, your leaders and ask your leaders to ask their, uh, their associates. Fifth, embrace an innovative mindset. I can't stress this enough. Um, people come to work, uh, I'll give you this example. When I worked in automotive very, very early in my career uh, as an engineer, I was, it was a union facility and I was kind of led by management to uh, just do my engineering responsibilities. I'm the engineer. I'm supposed to tell people what to do and how to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And what I learned when I would engage with machinists was that uh, many of them, because they worked a seven-on-seven-off uh, schedule, many of them were running businesses, side businesses, after work or when they were off. And I really started to think about that. And I was like, you know what? These people have the wherewithal to operate a business, whether it's a, a, a craft or whatever, it didn't matter. 
And it just really, really stuck with me that we didn't want their input for work that they were doing 8, 10, 12 hours a day. We didn't want their input. And so once I got past that and I really started to engage them, you know, as an engineer, I would tell them, here's the objective, here's what we're trying to accomplish. And I would set the boundaries, but I would engage them in what they, in ideas that they, that they uh, might have that could help enhance the process. So embrace an, an innovative mindset. And then make sure that you're speaking your language. Um, I always say that, you know, um, I can get a lot more done if I take the time to really understand what they're uh, dealing with and relate to them. To, uh, to a department or an associate and really, really understand and uh, listen with, with uh, empathy and listen actively to what challenges they're having. Because a lot of times people will say something, but that's not really, really what they are struggling with. And so as a, as a leader, you need to really be able to speak their language and get to the heart of what's wrong. And then the last one is understand that leading lean happens at all levels. Uh, whether, again, it goes back to leadership is not positional or it's not title, right? There are lots of uh, departments where a guy has been working 43 years. He's not a team lead. He's not, he's just a machinist or an associate. But he has powerful influence over his peers. So how can you leverage people like that to make sure you're helping to, uh, to achieve the things that you want to achieve? All right? All right, and then another thing is to determine how do you determine where coaching is needed? And so this is um, this is a bit um, nebulous in that it's, it's very difficult sometimes to see. But you want to, I always encourage leaders at all levels to spend some time just observing situations. Observe how, if you're a manager, observe how your supervisor handles a situation because that will give you insight as to um, if they need coaching and development, if they're actually telling people what to do versus asking great questions and engaging them in the problem. So, but as a coach, you want to be you want to be intentional about. I'm sorry, as a leader, you want to be intentional about determining where coaching is needed. A great example with a client uh, just this week. Um, share with them uh, the I'll say the general manager of the plant. You know, he really is very very. Uh, dedicated and devoted to this process, and he said, you know, how am I, he, they do 5S audit, and he uh, does a layered audit on a, on a frequency. And he says, you know, how do I engage or how do I shift what I'm doing when I go out to do these audits? And it's just one example. And I said to him, you know, your objective is if you see opportunities in the 5S audit, you need to ask the question, why did all of the other people between you and that, that area see the same thing? And then don't just go to the area and tell them what to do. Start coaching down in the organization. And I know it's a little frustrating. It takes a little bit more time, but it is extremely effective, and it is the key to making sure that everyone is learning in the organization. All right, what are success factors of effective daily management? So this is a question for you to engage. Um, again, in the chat, what do you consider success factors of uh, effective daily management? I've talked to you a lot, a lot about a lot of different things that I believe are success factors, but what are some of the things that you think um, give you a real indication that your daily management process is effective? And then I'll, I'll respond after that. Okay, do we have some chats, some uh, responses coming in? Yeah, I'm just taking a look here. Starting to see a couple coming in. If anyone has anything to uh, contribute, please uh, share. So Heather has, says, uh, team members are regularly suggesting solutions. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? All right, thank you so much for that. Um, sorry, we have a comment, I think, from, uh, from Ken. You need to define the behaviors of what you need from, the, from all levels as a prerequisite. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Ken. Yes. Any other comments on uh, what success factors? All right. So while other comments might be coming in, so that's exact. Those are those are great points. Uh, but the behaviors, the behaviors one is really really key um, because you can really see a shift when people get it and they really get that they can leverage this problem to um, to engage cross functionally. Uh, this process, I'm sorry, to engage cross-functionally to solve problems. You see people more energetic in terms of their level of engagement because they actually feel like they're, they're more valued by the organization. You know, people care what I think and that I'm able to make a difference. The other, uh, another success factor is that uh, people are able to see problems solved uh, more rapidly. And so that gets people engaged not only in problem solving, but then gets them more excited about continuous improvement opportunities. Because you don't always need a problem necessarily to make, to make an improvement. Another success factor is when your, lead, your, your managers and supervisors now have time to focus on strategic initiatives, right? They go from that firefighting mode to focusing in on strategic initiatives. So that's another great success factor. Uh, factor to look for. And then uh, the last one is, um, it's kind of hard for me to describe, but I call it when you hear a shift in the language. And what I mean by that is um, you hear the associates that are participating in the huddle asking great questions. So that means now you're starting to really, really penetrate the organization. So those are a few success factors that you really should pay attention to to determine if you have an effective process. And then I think we don't need to really talk a lot about this one, but you always want to be on the lookout for what's broken about the process and identifying critical signs that tell you when the process is broken. Again, are the metric discussions, are they effective? If you have now achieved a target and you're maintaining and sustaining that target, Perhaps it's time to change out that metric for another metric, okay? If you're not seeing people write problems up on the board or countermeasures that are effective, that's an indication or a sign that your process is broken. If people are missing the huddle meeting, not participating, stop the press. Your process is broken. So just make sure that you're thinking about answering this question um, as a leader. So these are these are critical indicators that you're on top of if the system is broken, broken or not. All right, and here's the slide that I talked about. Um, with my clients, I often uh, really, really uh, press upon them um, implementing a tiered daily management uh, structure. There are a few reasons why I do this um, that I don't, I don't have a lot of time to go into a, a lot of detail. But when you uh, implement a tiered management structure, it really, really allows you to focus problem solving at its respective level. And then the arrows indicate uh, identifying when that level is not able to solve a problem, how, what fashion should they escalate the problem to the next level? And then what is the flow down, the top, the gray ones are, what is the flow down as information needs to flow back down to, to the respective level when problems are uh, escalated. But the key reason why this is so critically important is when you think about a lean management system, business system, operating system, whatever you call it, and you think about all of the various tools and techniques and principles that you're trying to manage, whether it's Hoshin, Conry, strategy deployment, um, whether you have um, you know, 8Ds or the root cause analysis, whatever your quality management system is, as it relates to supply chain and uh, right-sizing inventories, uh, improving supplier quality, quality, supplier development, and then your own internal Kaizans, the number of Kaizans you have going on, uh, trainings that you have going on, it's a lot. And so what you want to be able to do is break those things out at respective levels 
so that you understand how do all of these work together as a system? And then how effectively am I engaging and involving all of the people in the system to ensure that the system is churning? And so that's what these years kind of represent, this total system, right? And so, um, you know, I think the main thing here is how do you how do you then begin to to separate information? And I'll talk a little bit about that as it relates to daily accountability. All right. So the purpose again to uncover interruptions, to be able to predict outcomes and eliminate causes, and then you really want to focus the organization on the critical few, right? There might be a ton of things that are going wrong, but what are the critical few areas where you need to close the gap as it relates to plan versus actual? And then you don't have infinite resources. So how do you, by focusing on the critical few, you can then align those resources uh, to focus there. And trust me, once you really, really get this process down, you start uh, minimizing the firefighting you can focus on more strategic projects and then focus on more strategic company or business initiatives. This process just really, really, really churns um, and helps you um, leverage the resources that you have to, to solve the problem. Next slide, please. All right, and then as a leader, it's your responsibility to be committed to the process, reinforce the other uh, leaders' commitment to the process and the discipline. And the discipline has to be on making process improvements that eliminate the causes of the gaps and plan the actual. And I love these three things at the bottom. If you don't have a stable environment, you can't standardize. Without a standardized process, you can't make improvements. So just remember, part of the daily management objective is to reinforce the commitment and the discipline, close the gap, but make sure that the process is stable. Then you standardize the process, then you improve the process, right? So that could be that could be a, a slide that you print off and hang in your office just as a reminder to what your real objective is in terms of daily management. Next slide, please. All right, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, uh, but visual controls are your friend. Visual controls are your friend. As a leader, you want to be able to, at a glance, know where you need to engage in the organization or make observations to make sure that the organization is effectively following the process. So visual, make things as visual as possible, whether it's color codes, uh, charts, you know, I hate to see a chart that doesn't have a target and a trend direction, right? Make it very, very easy to, to highlight the abnormality and then have those response plans so that you know exactly what actions people should be taking when and, and that's how you make sure that the system is actually effective. Next slide, please. All right, and then so I'll just come back to the main thing. Our objective here with daily management and anything else that we do in in, um, in the lean realm or Toyota way or whatever it is, basically continuous improvement and problem solving um, and process improvement is to understand that we need people to do that, right? So um, engaging the people, making sure that we're leading people and that we're asking people to lead that we're focused on the action and not the who is critically important to engaging, involving all people in problem solving, and to really keeping people engaged in in the purpose of what you're doing and why you're doing it. So, so with that, um, my last actual slide. I hope this actually this information has been um, has been you know helpful. I hope that you have identified at least a few nuggets that you can take away and start doing. And then I wanted to just tell you about a program that I'm introducing around Lead Lean because um, I, I really, really feel like um, we could stop asking the question about why Lean fails if we just figure out how to help leaders be more successful. I have not met a single leader in the organization that didn't want improvement in their business that didn't want their business to be successful 
and didn't want their people um, to engage to help them do so. But a lot of a lot of times, the lean tools are are confusing, and um, it's not clear what exactly you should do. So a lot of people say, "Oh, you should do gimbal walks." Okay, well, what should I do on the walk? How do I make the walk effective? And so. In January, mid to late January, I don't have a specific date yet, I want to introduce a coaching program for leaders, uh, leaders between managers and supervisors, I'm sorry, managers and executives. Um, I want to introduce a program, and I don't want this program to just be about training. I want to serve as your, your confidant and your coach to help you when you um, encounter uh, situations and you're not sure how to handle that. So in this program, it's a 12-week program of three months, you would have a weekly group coaching call with your peers. It, it would be totally confidential. Uh, no critical business information would be shared. And then once a month, you would have a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. And that would allow us time to actually work through specific uh, issues that you're experiencing within your organization. This is not about some broad brush approach. It's specifically about, you know, hey, Crystal, here's what's happening. Here's where we have a challenge. Do you have some recommendations? And also engage in recommendation from peers about things that they may have done to mitigate the, the situation. And then also included in that would be uh, self-study training material. So twice a month, I would uh, issue self-study training material in this in a fashion like this. It would be recorded where you could actually have material that you could share with your team um, to help them understand the process. And so, um, if you're interested in even learning more about what this would entail, if it's the right fit for you, uh, feel free to um, book a strategy, a free strategy session with me. There's no charge for this, and I'll put the link here in the uh, chat for everyone. And um, you can just book time with me to talk through it to see if it will be right for you, a right fit for you, and um, then we could go from there. There's no pressure. I'm not pressuring you on selling you anything, but I am just really, really passionate about making sure I help leaders be successful uh, in their lean journey. And if it's just a matter of, okay, you tell me to do a gimbal walk or you tell me to develop leader standard work, but I still don't really find it effective or know if what I'm doing is effective, then I want to help you help your organization um, to succeed. So so with that, um, I will turn it back over to um, to Derek, Joanna, and Miha, right. and uh, we'll go from there. Great. Thank you, Crystal. So I just had a, a couple comments come in that I just wanted to share. Um, oh, awesome. From Kathy, um, she had a few comments just saying that you know, she, as a manager, she, she doesn't work in the field. She's not an assembler or technician, but she knows how long projects should take and the tools required. By asking the questions, um, the staff know you're interested and that you care, and you're doing what you can to ensure they have the tools to accomplish their job. Um, okay, that's important. Yeah, and Ken sort of reiterate, reiterated what you said about stabilization and, and, and that a big part of stabilization is to standardize. So um, I think you know you commented that standard, stabilize first then standardize and sometimes standardizing helps with that stabilization as well. Absolutely. A lot of variation comes from people doing jobs in different ways. He said it takes a lot of discipline, small changes at a time and being committed to the process just like an exercise. Yeah, It's definitely a practice uh, and takes practice to do it for sure. Uh, if anyone has any final uh, questions or comments, please uh, please drop them in the uh, the chat window here, and we will uh, get them answered from Crystal. We'll give it a couple seconds if anyone has any questions for Crystal. Okay, so just waiting for some questions, and as we are waiting for some questions, I'm just going to uh, share a couple other things that are coming up. Um, we do have productivity leader training coming up in Sudbury from November on November 21st and 22nd, so you can register for that on our website. That's our uh, Lean Greenbelt Productivity Leader 
training. Um, and uh, so anyone who's interested in that, please register at our website. Uh, the other thing I'd like to tell you all about is a uh, webinar that I'm really excited about, uh, which I will be hosting next week. And that is going to be an introduction to change management with myself. And that's on Thursday, October 5th. 1:30 uh, p.m. and you can register for that at our website as well, yourpace.ca/events. We will be sending an email out tomorrow that will include the link to book a consultation with Crystal. Also include the link to this webinar with Derek for next week. So watch out for that email tomorrow. Okay. Well, I have not seen any uh, any questions come in um, on that one, Crystal. Um, I'd really like to thank you. There was a few things that came up today that uh, that I really thought were um, were great. I love that that hero syndrome you talked about. We see that quite regularly in the work that we do. Um, people love to be the ones ones who solve problems and put out fires, but not everybody um, sees the value in a nice stable process. <laughs> so. I thought that really resonated with me, and the other thing that uh, that that really resonated with me um, was your response to uh, to some of the questions as a leader. The I don't know, but uh, yeah. you know, let's let's find out together. Let's figure it out together. What do you need uh, to help you solve that problem? Um, all great questions that uh, lean leaders. Um, can ask and, and, and how they can respond to uh, to questions where they don't know the answer because you don't have to know all the answers. Work with your team and figure them out. That's great. Well, thank you guys again for the opportunity to share. Well, thank you very much and uh, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, hopefully, you're all off to enjoy your lunch now. So we'll let you uh, let you all go. Have a great day. Thank you.